Let's give him a hand and uh, let's see what God has for us. Mark, why don't you come on back up here for a second, if you would, please. Um, has this been a challenging year for you? Okay. I just sense that in the Holy Spirit. Uh, um, one of the things I learned in combat, um, good leaders are a gift from God. They are a gift from God. And great leaders will enable you to become who God's called you to be. Poor leaders will be a severe blockage to you. And this man, uh, I watch closely in our times here together, and I sense his tremendous love for you. And I sense also he's been under a lot of pressure this year. So uh, what I'd like you to do is stand to your feet, and I'd like to pray for this man. Father, we thank you for Mark. I thank you for his strength. I thank you for his integrity that I've seen at close range. I thank you for his tenacity. And Lord, his heart for you that is so rich and deep. And Lord, I pray, we pray that you would strengthen him in this year ahead, that this year ahead would be a time of tremendous blessing and release for him. I sense Isaiah 42, 16, that God's going to lead you in ways that he's never led you before. And he's going to make the dark way, he's going to make it light, and he's going to make the crooked way straight. These things he'll do for you, Mark, and he will not forsake you. And Father, we bless this man, and we will make a commitment to pray for him and to respond to him and to love him as you love him, and you called us to bless this man. And we thank you so much for his touch in our life, and we pray your blessing on him and his whole household in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah, I told him, I said... Uh, 250 Baptist churches, you probably have 25,000 different opinions, don't you? <laughs> uh, if there were 250 Pentecostal churches, you'd have 2.5 million different opinions and everybody having a word from God. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been a challenging year for me, too. Uh, this is a year of transition, it seems, in our culture. I went through probably one of the toughest transitions I've ever experienced in my life. God, a year and a half ago, uh, had two individuals speak just prophetically into my life and said that you're supposed to stop being senior pastor and move into this ministry that I'm now doing. They didn't delineate exactly what it was, but I knew what God was moving me towards. And I went through a whole year of letting go a church that I poured my life into for 24 years. It was a place where I learned to get up off the floor. Uh, I remember how I ended up in that church, in East Hill Church. I was working for uh, Roy X Jr. in uh, Face Center in Eugene, Oregon. And he walked into my office and threw a financial report on my desk and said, read it. That's the kind of way that Roy worked. And uh, I read about halfway through the financial report and I started crying because this church was in such deep, desperate financial situation. I'd been part of a charismatic church previously. And... Uh, <laughs> The business administered, stole a million and a half dollars and tanked the church, and I watched what happened to people's lives. And I remember saying, thank God I'm not part of this church, the financial report that I was reading. The next day I went in to see Roy, he was a senior pastor, he said, I'm sending you to that church. And it's going to fold and we'll send you there for six months and we'll pull you out. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And the moment he said that, the Lord said, no, you're going and stand." And I went, uh, uh. And so I got there and I came across and I just, you know, I went into survival mode. I came basically to the staff that was left. It was, it was eight million, four and a half million dollars in debt beyond the building payment. And that time I was 85, it was like 20 million dollars in debt. And a small staff and really declining attendance. And so I came in and I was, hi, I'm Mighty Mouse, I'm here to save the day. Uh, about uh, 15 months into it, I had a nervous breakdown. I didn't even have that in Vietnam. But I could stay drunk in Vietnam. You couldn't do that as a pastor. I didn't have that option anymore. <laughs> so, I was kind of caught, you know. 
couldn't hit the sauce anymore. Uh, so I remember I was in my office and I was sitting there and I, and I, I couldn't even walk, I couldn't talk, all I could do was cry and just pray. And it was 4.30 and it's time to go home and I, I couldn't even get up out of the chair. I remember I collapsed on my knees and just fell face first in this old, dirty, shag, brown rug carpet. And I'm laying there on my face crying out to God. And the Lord says, you ever wonder why you end up here? Once again, he's not asking for information. <laughs> I don't know. You know, how come you had to get a doctorate degree and no one in your family hardly ever graduated from high school? You couldn't be a fighter pilot. You had to be a Marine Corps fighter pilot. And then if someone in the squadron would fly under the bridge, the next day you'd fly under the bridge upside down. You ever ask yourself why you do this crazy stuff? No. Well, you need to start thinking about it. What I realized is that I'd taken my dysfunctional family and I'd taken the Marine Corps and I'd drug them into the kingdom of God and they don't fit. God said, we've got to start dealing with some of your stuff. That day I got up off the floor. It was a huge turning point in my life. And that's why there's a fellow in the Old Testament who's become a dear, dear friend of mine through the years. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. He's a rather, rather uh, uh, unknown character in Scripture. He has a strange name, but he and I have become very good friends through the years. I've read his story again and again and I'm brought back to it repeatedly. And I think it's an appropriate, uh, the Lord's placed on my heart, as a kind of a closing point, as a ceiling point for our time together. I've so enjoyed being with you, men. The openness and honesty with which uh, so many of you walked up to me and just opened your lives is stunning. I, I don't run into that very often. I don't say thank you. Second Samuel chapter 9, beginning verse 3. The king, this is King David. He's just taken over. The king asked, Is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There's still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he's in the house of Makar down in Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Makar and the son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid. And he had every reason to be terrified. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your, God, uh, your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? How did it end? Look at verse 13. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table and was crippled in both feet. There was a man by the name of Mephibosheth, and he was in line to be the next king of Israel. That is, until his father was killed in combat with the Philistines. And then God did something that only God can do. He reached over Mephibosheth and selected an absolute no -boy, nobody without violating Mephibosheth at all. He selected this man at the time he was a small boy by the name of David. We now recognize him as a credible, the greatest king of Israel. But at the time he was unknown. You remember the sequence that took place. Samuel, the prophet, is weeping because Saul has gone crazy. He's gone off the edge. He's consulting witches. He's just gone crazy. And you have to remember that, that Samuel was so close to Saul, when he anointed him, he kissed him. Now, Samuel was kind of a pugnacious individual, but he, he really connected with Saul. And to see Saul go over the end just really just grieved his heart. And God came to him and he said, stop weeping. I found the next king of Israel. Little shepherd boy on the hillsides of Judea. Outright me love songs, blowing me kisses, dances before me. I'll make him the next king of Israel. And he goes to Jesse's house, David's dad. He goes to Jesse's house to anoint the next king of Israel. And Jesse has all of his sons lined up and he looks at every one of them and he says, it's not the one. And then he asks this insane question, do you have another son? A Jewish dad would have every kid that he had, every son he had, lined up. I mean, you mean to be possibly the next king of Israel. That's a crazy question. But it's not crazy because Jesse says, oh, yeah, we have this hakaton, he says in Hebrew. This hakaton. Now, in the NIV, it's translated very kindly, this young one. It means this worthless one. Makes me suspect that David was an illegitimate child. Can't prove it, but suspect it. 
David was a nobody. And God took him from the guttermost to the uttermost. And you can always tell when someone has that experience in their life because they will worship like gangbusters. Because they know the next breath is courtesy of God. They know that everything they have is a gift from God. They know the position that they have is not something they deserved. It was a gift that God gave them. That was one of the things that God helped me to understand very early in my walk with him. I made a commitment to Christ in a bunker in Vietnam in the middle of a rocket attack. One week later, flying a mission, right on the edge of North Vietnam, they had put in a South Vietnamese battalion to inter intersect into the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And we had an emergency mission to go up there. They were being overrun. And so when you're coming in to support troops on the ground, you have to be very careful that you have a run-in line because here's the front line of the troops you're trying to protect. You have to make sure that you go parallel to them when you're dropping ordnance, especially napalm, because it'll just smear all over them. So you can't go crossways. You have to go parallel to them. So I'm flying, and my uh, squadron commander is the first in. He rolls in and goes in on the target and pulls off. And there's so much ground fire back and forth because they're, over, they're overrunning their position. It's just late night, and it's just fires going everywhere. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching it, and I didn't realize what I was doing. I had overran the running line. I'd never done that in my life. And once the squadron commander pulled off, pulled off, then the North Vietnamese were listening over the radio, and they figured out what the run-in line was, and they unloaded 27 and 37 millimeter anti-aircraft guns right up the run-in line. And I overran it, and I was here, and all but hell is just breaking loose right here. And God said, if you hadn't responded to me last week, you would have been right here. See, there's, uh, there's some things you need to know about God. He's gracious, but you don't push it. <laughs> because <laughs> he's holy and I understand my next breath with the courtesy of God now someone who gets a hold of that someone who understands that they will worship because they know it's a gift from God that they're still alive and they'll be incredibly gracious David says is there anyone left of the household of Saul that I can bless David what were you thinking Saul hunted you like a dog for over 10 years and you want to bless Someone in the household? David understands he's not in that position because he deserves it. It's a gift from God. Everything you have is a gift from God. And I love what the King James says. He says, he says this, I have a go fetch him out. <laughs> That's a strange word, isn't it? Fetch him out. In the King James, the word fetch is an old English term, which means to pull someone out of something. See, that's exactly what's happened to every one of us. Even if you were raised in a great Christian home and you grew up in the church, guess what? You were fetched out of the pit of hell. Now, I didn't get a, I didn't get a lot of amens on that one. You know why? Because we wear one of these things. Church teaches you to wear one of these things. We're a lot like uh, the Wizard of Oz. You know, he's pulling, pushing the levers like crazy, trying to get everything to look like it's okay until Toto comes along and pulls the curtain back. You know, I always wanted to be in a service where the Holy Spirit was just released and you'd walk down the house and just pull a curtain back on everyone and you could see what you're really like and you could see what he's really like and he could see what... Wouldn't that be a great service? <laughs> that would be great. I mean, the Holy Spirit just walking down to the house and everyone would see who you really are, what you've done in the dark, everything. I tell you, the altar call would be incredible. <laughs> It would just be incredible. It would be amazing. Now, we wear these things not because we're evil. We wear them because they work. Because of our hectic lifestyle. We're working like crazy. We're trying to raise a family. or We're trying to find a job with this economy. I mean, we're, we're, we're paying mortgage and all this stuff. And we don't have time to look behind the mask. Or if we do, we don't have time to tell someone what we found. That's why we say, how you doing? Fine. How you doing? Fine. You know, it's just the process of living in this life. Another reason we wear these masks is because the myths that we believe in our society. I mean, Diane and I do, uh, my wife and I do a seminar, the book's coming out in February, called Sexy Christians. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. I mean, if anyone should be experiencing healthy sexuality, it's Christians. And one of the things that blows you away, we've done it all over the world, we're going back to Amsterdam and Holland, and we'll be doing a seminar there. One of the things that blows you away is how few Christian couples really have a great marriage, a great sex life. 
because we believe in so many myths. Uh, you know, I, I used to premarital counsel a lot of guys, but I don't have much time for it anymore because I'm doing some other things. And one of the things that just used to crack me up is I'd say to the young guy, I said, you know what marriage is for? You go, yeah, woman, woman. <laughs> and I go, no, son, look, look, look right here. Lock in. <laughs> look at me. Marriage is for one purpose. It's to crucify you. You're a single male. You do not realize how selfish you are. She's going to give, be giving you an alphabetical list on a daily basis on how stinkingly selfish you are. Amen. Thank you very much. Yeah. What's well, so funny? I mean, you know, I, the guys just don't get it. You try to tell them. You say, listen to me. Please listen to me. I remember this one guy. He's a really brilliant guy, Harvard-educated guy. And I talked to him and talked to him and talked to him. He never could get it. And I remember after he'd been married about six months, he came back and goes, Dr. Roberts, we got to talk. I said, what, 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 what? He said, this woman, she's killing me. I said, I told you she'd do that. <laughs> and then, this is classic. I'm not making this up. He goes, but I'm head of the house. <laughs> I said, son, do you know what that means? <laughs> and he was honest. He goes, well, not really. <laughs> I says, it means you're first to the cross. If anybody's going to get nailed, you're first up. <laughs> See, marriage is this marvelous growing machine that God has developed. It, you're going to have to grow up to have a good marriage. There's no other options. I mean, it's just, you, when, you, when you get married, you meet your patient and you meet your physician at the same time. See, marriage is to heal you. That's what it's designed for in a fallen world. And it's crazy, the ideas we have in our culture. I remember I came home one early one day, just turned on the TV, I was normally watching news, and Oprah was on. I don't watch Oprah. And I realized why. <laughs> they had this gal on there, she's a Hollywood starlet. I, I'm not into Hollywood starlets, I don't know what they do, but I knew a little bit about this gal. And she was telling all the women how to catch a guy and keep him. And she had been married so many times, the woman had rash, rice marks on her face. I mean, it was nuts. <laughs> like, what's wrong with this picture? And a lot of times we wear these masks because we had them put on us when we were kids. We're told, this is a Christian family. You, you don't talk about that stuff. You don't deal with that stuff. You just suck it up and go on. But however we have them put on us, it's so hard to get them off. And it says that Mephibosheth was down in Lodabar. Now, Lodabar is a place that means, by its very nature, the Hebrew term means desolate or no communication. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but that's where you feel like you are. That's where you feel like you are. You felt because of what you've done in the past or what was done to you, you've just been disqualified. I've come to tell you by the grace of God, that's not true. That is not true. Mephibosheth's down in Lodabar and all of a sudden here's a knock on the door. Who is it? Ziba. I don't know any Ziba. About 30 seconds later, here's a knock on the door again. Who is it? Ziba. What do you want? The king has need of you. I've come to declare to some of you today the king has need of you. There's nothing that you've done or nothing that has been done to you that will disqualify you from the grace of God. See, here's what God does for us. It's amazing. We're down here in Lodabar. We're down here in a desolate place, separated from God. And he comes down, and by his goodness and grace, he picks us up, and he brings us into the kingdom of God and brings us into a place of blessing. That's how you got here. That's how you got here. Well, no, no, I raised my hand to say yes to Jesus one day. No, no, God gave you the ability even to raise your hand. He gave you the heart to do that. He gave you the emotions to do that. He's the one that provoked that from the beginning. See, he's the one that got you to this place. But you've got a problem for most of us. Mephibosheth is delivered, but guess what? He's damaged. 
He's in the place of blessing, but he's damaged. Now, how do you get damaged? Well, you look at 2 Samuel, read the whole book, you find out what happened. When it was announced that David was the next king of Israel, that sent a shockwave through the ancient Near East. Because if you became king and your dad had not been king before, it was standard operating procedure that you would hunt down and slaughter every member of the previous family. Because if they were allowed to live, then your kingship was in sheer jeopardy. And so Mephibosheth's nanny or nurse, he was a little guy at the time, picked him up and to save herself, she ran and dropped him. He's struggling today because of how he was dropped in the past. Anywhere in here knows what it feels like to be dropped? By a father? By a parent? By a pastor? By someone that you were counting on and you got stabbed in the back? Now you go on, you function, but it affects the way you relate. It affects your ability to love. It affects your ability to respond. It affects you. Now, for you to do what other people do normally, it takes a miracle. Now, God's bringing the miracles, but it's still, you're, you're, you're crippled. There's this capacity that's limited within you. And you start seeing it. You start seeing in your life and the reactions that you can have, especially if you're married. It just really shows up real quickly. My wife is a problem solver. She loves to solve problems. She'll ask me a million questions. And it took me years to figure out she was a problem solver. I was just reacting. Because my mom, who was an alcoholic, when I became a teenager, and you have to separate yourself from your mom, you have to do that if you're ever going to be a man yourself. When I began to separate from her, I was her emotional support, so she began to smother me with questions. Began to constantly badger me. So when a wife is doing what she naturally does, as God-given problem solver, when she starts asking the question, wham, I react to her. There's this crippledness within me. And I think it's her problem. And I'm reacting to her. And it's just tearing things up. And there's a sense in which for years I was going like, I've been delivered. It should feel different than this. Felt like a Christmas package had been delivered, but it had been damaged. And that produces a sense of aloneness in your soul. Existential loneliness. I mean, if, if there's, if there's going to be any sense of intimacy in you, there has to be someone who sees into me, you see, if I'm going to experience intimacy. Now, here's, here's the, here's the punchline. The whole time Mephibosheth is down in Lodabar and feels like no one even knows he's alive, the king the whole time is preparing a place at the table for him. There's a place at the table for you. Jesus said this to every man who decides to follow. He said, where I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you will be there with me one day. Now, the way I used to see that is I, yeah, okay, he's preparing a place for me, but it's going to be a table that's about two million miles long, and I'll be in the cheap seats down there. That's the way I thought about myself. I'll be in the cheap seats. And I remember one day a guy says, no, I'm omniscient. I'm all powerful. I've got a place set for just you and me. And that's what I want you to experience even today, son. I want you to start living life as if I've prepared a place for you, which I truly have. I love you so deeply and profoundly. I love you with all of my heart. And there's a sense in which it's hard for us to believe that truth. That's why Mephibosheth, he says, what, what, what would you, what would you, why would you respond like this, like a dead dog like me? See, when you're trying to communicate this to, to men so frequently, they, they react negatively to it. I remember Harry Flanagan, who's, Harry, why don't you raise your hand? Yeah, he's part of our staff. He had affairs with a number of women in his church. He was a pastor. And so they gave him the appropriate boot out of the ministry. And about 15 years ago, I remember he came in East and he sat all the way in the back and just cried. He sat there and wept. And I remember I wanted to go back to see him, and the Lord said, no, don't go see him yet. And as soon as the service would end, he'd run out the door. And finally, one day, the Lord said, go back and see him. And so I had to maneuver quickly in the corner, Harry. And I went up to him, and I took his hand, I said, how you doing, Pastor Harry? And I noticed all the color in his face changed. 
And I asked him a couple years after that incident, and I said, Harry, what was happening? He said, it felt like a knife was stuck in me because I was totally worthless. I'd violated everything. You see, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. He won't give up on you. Harry is now one of my most trusted men helping churches to develop for men-only ministries. Amen? Amen. I remember a good brother who's a therapist in Los Angeles, good Baptist brother. And uh, which I remember my doctors from conservative Baptist. I'm a Baptist West Acostal, okay? <laughs> Equally offend any denomination is what I do. And so he started using for men's only ministry and, uh, and starting using it in all the churches. And he finally said, you know, I need to do it in our church. And so he got all the men together, and they had this big prayer meeting, and they were going we're gonna to pray about starting this pure desire ministry in our church because we realized how many men are struggling with this. And so he was going to have the guys all pray together, and the Lord said to him, no, first of all, you need to have them pray for you because sometimes your brain gets a little bit out of balance. And you're struggling with lust every now and then. You're not acting out, but you need to. And I remember he told me, he said, he says, I had my, my therapist mask on, and I just didn't want to take it off. Because I shouldn't have any struggles with this. Like I'm not a human being. And he said, you know, finally I pulled the mask off and dropped it and said, guys, would you pray for me? I'm not acting out, but sometimes my brain goes a little bit sideways on this. And he says, they prayed for me. All of a sudden, I saw in my soul, there was like this branch that had thorns on it, and it was snapped, and it was thrown out, and man, it was just released. He says, that was incredible. He says, hey, you know, I'm a Baptist. I never have visions like that. You Pentecostals have them all the time, but that was incredible for me. <laughs> all of a sudden, he realized, he realized the goodness and the grace of God. See, he had been dropped as well. But there's this dilemma God has this dilemma. Mephibosheth is delivered, but he's damaged. See, here's the point. At some point, he's got to get up off the floor. He's got to get bought off of the floor. I'm not talking about trying harder. God brought him to this place of blessing, but at some point, he's got to get up off the floor. As Paul put it, he says, leaving those things behind, not in denial, not saying it doesn't matter. I process those things, but I don't let my past define who I am. Because God's always dealing, me, dealing with me in light of my destiny, not my difficulties. And I have to do whatever I have to do to get up off the floor. If I have to crawl hand over hand to get there, somehow I need to get to my place in the kingdom of God and have a seat. Now, as you begin to get up off the floor and war with this issue in your life, you'll discover about the time you get close enough to smell the blessing of God, hell will unleash a full attack against you. Because you're this close to breakthrough and he sees it. That's where some of you are. But whatever it takes, whatever you have to do, you need at some point to finally get up off the floor and get into the place where God has called you. And once you're sitting there, you know what you'll discover? You'll discover that you should have died in that auto wreck. You'll discover that you should have lost your mind in that financial situation. But God was faithful to you. And you realize there's no demon in hell that can stand against you if you get up off the floor. Now, I mean, picture the scene. If you walked into King David's dining hall, here would have been Mephibosheth, seated, and he would have looked like nothing was wrong with him. Seated with all these princes and the rulers and everything. I mean, it just would have been incredible. You would have walked in and said, but if you pulled back the tablecloth, you'd see he's still crippled. See, I just told you my G-rated story. I didn't tell you the full version because I'm still crippled. But guess what? The blood of Jesus Christ covers me. And in the process of him covering me, I can have a seat at the table as if I had never been dropped. As if I had never been dropped. 
See, it's so important for you to realize that God is prepared. I mean, here's Mephibosheth. He's eating at the king's table. He's eating bread from grain he never planted. He's having wine from vineyards he's never planted. That's exactly what God wants to do in your life. He's saying, I want to give you homes you've never built. I want to give you wine that you never planted the vineyards. I want to give you bread from grain that you've never planted. I want to bless you, but you've got to get up off the floor. And as you get up off the floor, you'll find out that, guess, guess what? God will carry you, and he'll make it up to you, irrespective of what you've done. See, you have to understand something. God is not some uptight evangelical. He's not obsessed with your sin. He doesn't see you good stuff and bad stuff. He doesn't see it that way. He's dealt with the bad stuff at the cross. So get over your bad self. Amen? Yeah. He's dealt with it at the cross. When he looks at the area where you go, oh, I'm really bad here. You know what he sees? There's a place I want to do a miracle. If you'll just get up off the floor. And this is a lifestyle. This is a lifestyle. That's why Mephibosheth is such a blessing to me constantly. I'm sitting in the final process of uh, certification as a sexual addiction therapist. Whew, well, that was an experience. That's like doing lamp swim in a cesspool. <laughs> I remember the first, the first session I went to, uh, you know, it's a whole year-long process. The first session was from 8.30 to 12.30 on sexual fetishes. It's not a Christian organization, okay? And after four hours of sexual fetishes, I'm sitting there and said, I didn't even know you could do that with a human body. And I went outside and I said, God, would you just power wash me, you know? <laughs> but I'm sitting there in all these clinical, secular clinicians, and we're in a therapy group, and they said, now, we want you to turn and share something you may have struggled with for all of your life. And the Lord said, you need to share it. And I went like, oh, man, I'm not doing that. It's about Vietnam, the trauma that I had. And I mean, I've gone to clinical counselors and I talk to them and they go, uh-huh, and how did that feel? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, how did that feel? I mean, they don't get it! And then I share it with some other people and they go like, eyes white, too much information! So I've tried to share, you know, I said, God, I try to share. Do you need to share it now? And I looked over and who's my therapy party partner? It's about a 120-pound Peruvian PhD candidate lady. I'm saying, oh, she's not going to understand. The Lord says, no, you need to share. So I turned to Isabella and I said, here's what I struggle with. And all of a sudden I started sharing and she got it. Tears are coming down her face. And I said, how come you understand? She said, well, I worked for the Peruvian government when a dictator was in charge. My husband had left me. I was a single mom. And they were, the government was abusing women. And so we decided, some of the ladies decided we we're going to have a march on the presidential palace. And the president said that if there was any march, he would shoot us. So I went to my daughter the night before, she was junior high age, and I said, Hun, uh, I, I want to make this march tomorrow because we've got to stand up for the abuse, the, all the abuse that's taking place in our culture. But I won't do it if you, if you don't say it's okay. And I, you know, I could be shot. You could be totally no support and the next morning her little daughter came in junior high gal and she said mom go march for me and Isabella told me the story of turning the corner and marching arm to arm and here's the soldiers with guns right at her and she survived it and here's what got me God sovereignly picked this lady from Peru set her beside me and God said, I want you to get up off the floor. I want you to process your stuff. I'll be faithful to you. And Ted, I will set up situations for you again and again and again where life may have dropped you. You may have been stabbed in the back. You may have been crippled. But if you'll just trust me and get up off the floor, you'll move into the blessing that I have for you. Because if you stay down there, you'll be in a place of blessing, but you'll never move into it to full extent. So my challenge for you this morning before we leave, for some of you, you've been knocked flat. For some of you, this economy has knocked you flat. 
For some of you, your family situation has knocked you flat. For some, it's your past has knocked you flat. And there is an issue in your life right now. God sent me here this morning to challenge you. It's time for you to get up off the floor. It's time for you to stand to your feet and say, God, by your grace, I'm going to walk into the blessing you have for me, and this is not going to be controlling my life anymore. I will be wide open to where you say, I need to step forward and get up off the floor. So if that's where you're at, would you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you before we go. Mark, why don't you come on up? Now, I'm not asking everybody to stand, okay? Would you join hands together? The way we get up off the floor is frequently someone's helping us to get up. Father, we're taking a stand today. We're acknowledging, first of all, that there's areas in our life where the enemy has hammered us. And sometimes we've helped him hammer us. Sometimes we make stupid decisions, and we acknowledge that. But the stupidness of our decision does not determine the future that we have in you. When we acknowledge that we've made mistakes, or we acknowledge that others have wounded us and we've so easily held it in and there's been bitterness and anger, we push that aside and we declare, by your grace, we're getting up off the floor today. As we come down off the mountain, we're coming down as a different man. We're coming down as someone who's no longer going to be controlled by that. For some of us, it's reactions to our wives. We're not going to be controlled by our past reacting in the present. By your grace and by your power, Lord, we're going to be wide open to the healing message that you have to give into our soul. So Holy Spirit, Spirit, come today, and would you clean out some areas that need to be cleaned out in our soul? And we take a stand against the forces of hell, declaring the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and we will move into the purpose and plans that you have for us. We will take our place at the table of blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Let's lift an applause offering unto the Lord.